21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. So, you know, the book that I wrote, uh, Who's in Charge, really comes from my personal experience having worked in the corporate world for many, many years and now uh, supporting senior leaders in their work. Because what I've seen again and again and again is especially the best of them. They, um, they understand that for their organizations to have a success, to be competitive, to remain competitive, and actually to have impact, to solve problems, to have success in the market, the old way of managing, the old way of leading based on force and control doesn't really work anymore. So the people I'm working with, they're looking for new ways to lead. And what I've seen is that it's really about the understanding of power. What is power? Uh, is it only to sit there and to control or is it to have an impact to create something that you want to create? And so my, my own learning process was that it's all about our understanding of power and our application of power. So that was like the at the core of the book that I've created, um, Who's in Charge? And uh, the other two parts are energy and legacy. Energy because um, my, in my own experience, having worked in the corporate world, I know what it feels like to be overloaded, to be like fighting on different fronts uh, and to be like at the brink of, can I still do this? Uh, so it's a lot about being able to manage our energy. Sometimes we can also say, no, we can't do this. But many, many times we we want to achieve what we want to achieve. So we can't actually say no to so many things. So the question is, how do we manage our energy? How do we manage the energy of our teams? So it's about energy management. And there, my desire in the book was to teach people um, what energy, what our human energy really is, going beyond the more mechanical understanding of energy. Uh, for instance, you can see that many corporates have a gym, but uh, only the best corporates have a meditation room uh, or mindfulness courses. So having a larger understanding of, of, of what energy is and how to maintain and manage our energies, but it goes far beyond that even. And then the final part, legacy, was seeing how, especially senior leaders going into their like 50s, 60s, are thinking about, so I'm hugely successful. I like make really good money. Uh, I'm, I'm respected uh, because of the status I have, but is that really what I wanted to create in my life? Um, and this is not about uh, necessarily fame and having um, um, a building named after your name. It's really, did I live my life? And um, have I been fulfilled? Have I been in line with my own values? And I've seen leaders in their late stages thinking, well, actually I didn't. And that's where I feel like the success without fulfillment, actually it's the ultimate failure. And um, so I want, with my book, to encourage people to say, well, I can create a legacy. It's not about fame and um, immense status. It's about having the success, but also being in alignment with ourselves.
So getting to especially the topics like the parts of the book that are about energy and power is very much related to my own path in life. Um, meaning that I, like many of us, um, came into adulthood more on a mental um, path, like being told that studying hard and, and being smart, mentally smart, is the most important thing to succeed. And it's really important. I don't deny that at all. Um, but it's not what is, in the end, only solely deciding uh, whether we are successful as people, as leaders. So my own path was to, from my adulthood to, from my, from my adolescence, to really focus on the mental, like to study hard, to be good at school, and to take all that very seriously. And I also loved it because I can get very exhilarated uh, through like mental um, activity, like finding things out, focusing, explaining things, um, creating um, systems out of seemingly chaotic stuff. So that's fun. Uh, but when I uh, got through university, my PhD, and started to work, I realized, first of all, um, understanding things analytically is a great thing, but it's not all that 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 helps you. It's very much the relationships, uh, the way that you talk to people, um, the way that you uh, can build relationships that is important if you want to get things done. And uh, then I realized also that um, to be fulfilled as a person, I wanted to add again all these other facets of being a human being. And that is uh, use my body fully. And that's where I restarted to, to dance, which I had done as a, as a younger person. Um, I have done a lot of music in my in my life, so I took in again singing lessons, and um, I um, um, took my painting more seriously again. For some time, I was doing dance and painting, so I had an exhibition about a painting about dance, so the movement and. Um, uh, like the, the 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 stillness and the movement and the energy between bodies and all that later on I found again in my coaching career because as a coach you become very um, sensitive very observant about energies of your clients about energies in a room um, about um, what's happening in the space and there I realized I have something to give even when I was still in corporate and I was doing co coaching as part of my work, I realized that having that sensitivity that I, I think I required as an artist, so in singing, dance, painting, music, uh, I could bring that in to the, the corporate world. So to help people uh, also to become more sensitive about like, where do I stand in the room? Uh, where do I position myself? Am I too close? Am I too far away from someone? How do I project my voice? Am I coming in too strong? Um, which I call like being in, in broadcasting mode. Or am I too withdrawn? So people don't realize that I'm actually in the room. Or am I connected to the other person? So the other person really can feel me and can listen to me as a human being. And all that I found hugely valuable when coaching leaders because um I, I get that again and again people say how do i speak to this person for instance this is a very difficult conversation do i come in with authority or um well actually i don't want to because i want to be kind and then they're starting to be really in a smudge uh between like broadcasting and being withdrawn uh and that can teach them to be in, con in connection with with a person and i know that all all that i have not learned in coaching school i have actually learned in art school so in in dancing and in, in singing and 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 in and in art and so uh that has also taught me that any leader who allows themselves to be a whole human being has more richness in what they're doing so it's not only my path. I can see it also for, for the people I serve.
So an example of this um, control versus control and force versus openness and impact uh, for me is, is manifests itself in, in very simple actions and, and communication. So during the time that I was a, um, uh, a staff counselor back in my, in my corporate time many years ago, I saw, for instance, mediating between managers and staff. I sometimes saw how the manager the, as a leader did not really fulfill their managerial leadership role by hiding behind a wall. It was clear that they were afraid either of the impact of the bad news they had to announce or uh, of their own emotions, or maybe also of the other person, the staff member being disagreeable. But what they were doing, they were hiding. And as a leader, you don't hide. As a leader, you're there, you're present. And when these... Um, managers did their hiding so that could be either by withdrawing uh in this in this um talking to themselves rather than being clear and open like saying things indirectly so as a leader you wouldn't like disappear but you would try to have the other person understand what you want to say by like hinting at it but that's not leadership that's like being unclear and you're not in service of anyone so they would create confusion and fear on the other side. There were other leaders who would like overdo it. So that's this broadcasting way of communication to push it too much or to have a very hard tone of voice where I said, oh, this is the same person that I spoke to a day ago when we prepared this meeting. Oh, it was the same person, but a person that was in fear. So the leader would, instead of being calm and relaxed and personal would hide behind that voice of sternness of rigidity of harshness and that was not because they were naturally had natural authority it was on the contrary they were fearful and they were therefore hiding behind uh, behind that wall the impact also was their confusion because the staff member would feel attacked or um, like maybe the, my manager wants to punish me and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So because of that fear reaction, there was a fear reaction on the other side. And these cases normally did not go very well. I've also worked with uh, leaders or I've supported leaders to get to that place where they could be calm and relaxed inside. And when they were in this um, position of calm, confidence and openness, they could actually be connected to that other person and say these things that needed to be said in an empathetic way, but a clear way also. And the message would always pass. It was very interesting, like the people who were afraid that they would say something too hard or it, they didn't really want to be there at this moment, they would not have the message passed. But the person who was calm and connected to the other, they would have it passed. And uh, that showed me really again and again in, in, in so many ways and so many times how powerful it is to manage ourselves, to manage our own like state of mind and state of body also, uh, because the impact is much greater. Stillness doesn't mean uh, we can also start right away. Stillness doesn't mean inactivity. So when I'm there, there are two kinds of stillness that I'm using. One is stillness where I take my space for myself to resource myself. So I go, people go for walks in nature. I go for walks in nature or I, I meditate uh, to get the stillness and therefore get my own power. And that is one kind of stillness, which is more the nourishing kind of stillness. But there's also another kind of stillness, which is the stillness in the storm. So I did martial arts um, 
some time ago. I stopped it now, but I really loved the the exercise of it and the philosophy, the um, the attitude of it. And one thing I learned in martial arts is that you are never um, in disequilibrium. You have to be in stillness in a way so that you can react in any direction possible. Because if you are leaning too much in one direction, so you are, if you, if I translate that into leadership, I'm pushing in one direction. I'm, I'm trying to, to force my argument. I'm, I already know what I want in this conversation and I'm close. I can know what I want, but I shouldn't be closed. Then I have less power in that situation. Whereas when I have, um, like imagine it like the, um, the, the silent still center of a hurricane. I'm there so I can have all the power and the energy around myself, but I'm, I'm still inside all that stuff that happens around me. And that gives me power. To give an example about the stillness is something that probably I have the tendency to naturally do and I see therefore how it works is that when um, things go really rough then I get into this point of stillness. Um, so I could panic but actually what I do is to get very calm and then I'm able to act. I remember many years ago when I was uh, working at the European Commission was actually my one of my first jobs there. Um, I uh, was leading the telecommunication sector for um, uh, Russia and the, the, the other parts of the former Soviet Union. And we had a conference in Brussels and um, it was about telecoms and the Russian delegation was there. And all of a sudden I was told, Sylvia, you, you should go to meet the Russian delegation over there and they're pretty angry because it seems that um, your predecessor had neglected them. So I was, I went there because it was my role, my duty. So I had to go there and I had these three very angry men, middle-aged men. I was a young woman standing there and they were just very grumpy and very angry with their um, Russian English. And I said, oh my God, I have to do something. So I went really calm and said, I'm so happy to meet you. And this is not the right place here to talk, but let's meet back at the office. And uh, um, if have you do have time in two hours. And so we met and they, when we met, they were again, very angry. And um, I just felt naturally, I have to be quiet and still inside and um, just act from there. And I felt that because I was quiet and still inside, I could communicate with them with kindness and speak to them as human beings. So what I said in the end was something like, why are you here? You want to create projects and to bring something home. You want to bring home good news. And that's also what I want. I'm here, I mean, I've been put into this position because we want to do better for you. Uh, my predecessor didn't have that much time. And that's why I was put in this um, position. And now we can work together, let's do that. And because I had um, calm and peace in my heart, they could hear that. If I had I been nervous or stressed, they probably couldn't have heard that. And they would more heard the tension or the defensiveness or whatever and wouldn't have worked that well. So that was one of the many examples I know for myself and, and, and clients of mine where this stillness inside is, um, is very powerful.
I wrote the book because I wanted to to bring all my own lessons from the corporate world and and my coaching experience to a broader audience. And with the book, I really want to help people understand how can they like shift their understanding and use of power so that they can be more successful, more uh, impactful in their organizations and their in their leadership. Uh, to adapt their leadership more to the demands of the world today. Um, the second part about the energy. How can you, in a very practical way, um, without studying a lot, but really getting quite rapidly an understanding of what is what is your human energy made of, and how can you um, how can you reinforce it? How can you maintain it? How can you even extend it? Um, like get this understanding and get some tools to really do it for yourself. And uh, then also for legacy, because many people I, I've spoken to say, well, legacy, that's not for me. Or that's for the very important people or that's for much later. And um, I've learned myself that legacy is a serious business because what is what if um, you died in a month? Would you be happy with the life that you have lived? And uh, that's also something I want to give to people to have that understanding that we have the illusion maybe that we will live forever, but we don't. And so therefore today is the day where we really start to, to live the life with our leadership, with our outward success, but also the, add the inward success and create therefore the life that we want to create and therefore the legacy that is really ours. That is really, in a nutshell, what the book is about. And um, I'm so excited now that it's coming out in, in September and that people will be able to read it. How do we have to adapt to the change world that is much more complex and, and, and fast changing that we have today? So why does it not work the way that we have managed and led before? Um, with the complexity and, and, and rapid change, uh, we have to bring out the best of the people we leave. Often they are like overstretched. So we have to, to engage them in a way that we can't engage them if we just bark down or orders down the corridor. Um, we also have, so we have to give them a vision. We have to give them direction. We have to lead with purpose. And that's part of the understanding of power. Um, we also have to understand that in order to resolve complex problems and in order to um, create more impact, we have to move from a uh, win-lose, like who is stronger, um, approach to power to a collaborative and win-win approach to power. What I mean with, with that is, first of all, internally in an organization, we all know these study cases of um, uh, sales uh, and marketing and development, they don't understand each other, they fight with each other and they um, um, hide information from each other because each of them believes that they are um, holding the holy grail and are the sole defenders of the company. I mean, I, I exaggerate, I characterize, but it's often these um, fighting internally against each other with everyone coming from the best possible place, wanting to do the best for the company, but actually they're not doing the best for the company because they're not sufficiently collaborating. So that's internally. How do we get from this um, position of competition with each other to let me understand what is your problem? Let me understand how I can help you so that we help each other. It also means that we have to be able Therefore, to give up some control in order to have more control together. So that means 
if I want to collaborate with someone else, I can't have it all my way. I have to make some compromises because the other person or the other division uh, um, uh, department has their legitimate perspective. So how can I pull that control together so that we together actually have more control, more power? So that is like the essence of this change of, of perspective to think more in terms of how can we collaborate, have um, have functioning relationships, not thinking that it's all that I or that we in my department do, but it's how can we um, co-create through communication, through pulling of, of, of control, through um, living collaboration, through co-creation, and therefore achieve more. So that's internally, but also externally. So if you are a company in this world, yes, you're in competition, but sometimes you're also in collaboration with your competitors. So you can, in some moment, you might be in competition, but actually for all of you to achieve more, sometimes you want to collaborate and to collaborate honestly, because if you don't do it honestly, it doesn't work. Also very important to understand that being in collaboration is not being um, like not existing anymore, like giving it all away. Um, being in collaboration means, yes, st standing on your own firm ground, whether it's in a meeting, uh, in the moment. So how can we co-create something? It's not that you forget about who you are and what the interests, for instance, of your, of your team, of your division are, but you remain open to what the other side wants. And you're really able to co-create. In um, acting, uh, we, then, we, we call that the um, yes and method. So in, instead of saying yes but, which we very much all have the tendency to do, so we listen, we pretend to listen, or we think we are listening, but actually we are already there ready with our but to bring forward <laughs> this incredibly good point of view that we have. Um, which might be the best point of view in the world, but if we always do the yes, but we are killing the collaboration. So if I then am able to say yes and and come with the spirit of yes and, I will encourage the other person to really bring all the jewels that they have and put them out on the table so that we have much more material to work with. And I still will not give myself away because I know what I want. I know who I am but I'm able to invite the other side so that together we can create more because we have more material. So if this shift in, uh, in the understanding and use of power, uh, this um, use of your energy, uh, this expansion of your energy and, and, and the possibility to create your legacy, if that has spoken to you, if you're curious to learn more, then it's really, uh, the book is there for you. It will be out in September um, and you can buy it. You can find it also on my website, smartpowermethod.com. You'll find it there. you find it also on Amazon. Who's in charge? How to lead with power, with real power and create an impact in a chaotic world. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskorik. Imagine a space where triumphs, trials, and tales of entrepreneurship come alive. Welcome to the 21st Century Entrepreneurship Podcast, a gold awarded journey hosted by Martin Piskorik, connecting with listeners in 95 countries and ranking in the top 0.5% of all podcasts. Join our exclusive community Elevate your perspective and embark on the path to success.